Welcome to the Indestructible Podcast, hosted by Danny Connor. Hello, my heroes, and welcome to this week's edition of the Indestructible Podcast, the podcast for the people, the podcast that can never die. I am your host, the Indestructible Danny Cano, and today I'm sitting here with Emmy-winning producer and director Steve Miller. Steve, how are you today? I'm pretty good, Danny. Thanks for having me on the podcast. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for joining us. I recently had the pleasure of sitting in on a class that Steve was guest teaching in, And within that class, what struck me first with Steve was his incredible amount of history when it came to TV directing. And I think oftentimes what some of our listeners have been asking me is what is the key differences between TV directing versus film directing? Because I think oftentimes when people just hear that word director, they oftentimes think of the the very traditional, like the guy sitting in the chair, a Steven Spielberg type film director. But what I love to touch upon, Steve, on the show is people that are working in the field, but outside of the typical norms that we've kind of, as a society, predispositioned in our minds with what that may be. So just tell us a little bit about yourself, Steve. Give us a little bit of a, of a background on yourself. Like, did you always know you had the soul of a storyteller inside of you or t- talk to us about that? You know, I first became, well, even before high school, I became interested in media. When I was a kid, I loved disc jockeys. I loved popular music. And I had a record player. Some of you might even know what that is. Kind of like the uh, predecessor to a CD player. And I had a tape recorder. And I would make my own DJ uh, shows on my tape recorder. I even won the top 10 uh, 45 records from my favorite radio station. My mom had to drive me over and we picked up the records. So I was really into media. When I uh, was in high school, um, they opened up the thing that they called Information Retrieval, which was a television studio. And the whole idea was they were gonna have a a library of lectures and they'd be able to play them out to classrooms. And as part of that, they had a little TV studio with I think three cameras and a switcher and audio and the whole thing. And that's really where I learned all the jobs for the first time, being a camera operator, being a switcher operator, being an audio mixer. It was a great experience. And really I spent all of my free time in there in school when I I didn't have to be somewhere else I was there Uh, for some reason they even gave me a key to that studio and my friends and I would sneak onto campus the high school campus on the weekends and we would make our own dance shows so it was pretty cool and so um, when it came time to go to college um, I I looked at various colleges I decided to go to USC Uh, you know USC had a really wonderful reputation and it still does And I was going to be a double major uh, with broadcasting and with electrical engineering, which I was also interested in. And I started that for the first uh, semester or two, and it was just impossible. It was impossible to do both. And I was much more interested in broadcasting. So I dropped the electrical engineering and I majored in what they called back then telecommunication, which was supposed to be radio and television broadcasting. So bad thing and good thing. The bad thing was in my classes at USC in four years, I learned nothing about broadcasting. No, no projects, no shooting, no cameras, mm-hmm. no microphones, no production, none of that. Wow. It, it was, it was, I, I actually thought about suing them for fraud when I graduated. But the good side is being in Los Angeles, I got jobs the whole time I was in school. I got a lot of jobs. I started on the radio station there at USC, which was a full power radio station. And at that time, it was completely student run. And um, actually, I have a pretty good uh, story about how I broke into uh, being on the radio station. I was sort of on a waiting list, and I was kind of willing to do anything. And very early in my in my first semester at college, we went up to Berkeley for a football game. We got there really early. We're sitting in the stands. Nothing was happening. And I thought, well, I'll just sneak into the press box and see if there's anything interesting happening in the press box. So I did. I walked right in. There was no security. And right off the bat, I recognized this kid who was probably a junior at USC who I knew was the sports announcer for KUSC radio. I went up and I introduced myself to him. I said, I'm Steve Miller and I, you know, trying to get a job at the radio station. He had this enormous mic mixer with him, just a big box with these four big knobs on it. He pointed at it and he said, do you know how to work this? I said, yeah, I do. I mean, I knew it from high school. He said, okay, you're going to be my engineer today. He said, my crew didn't show up. Then he said, do you know how to do color commentary on football? I said, no way. Yeah. He said, do you know how to do statistics? I said, no. He said, you're going to do that too. And so starting with that game, I was the uh, engineer slash producer and the statistician for every USC home football game and home basketball game for four years. 
And as an engineer and producer, I think I was pretty good and I learned a lot. But as a statistician, I was terrible. And my stats were terrible. But that's the way it was. And it was a really good, a really good experience. It probably helped me get um, a summer internship that I had at KNX News Radio where I worked in the newsroom. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a cool thing. And then uh, I applied for an internship with the Television Academy. Mm -hmm. And I got one. And by the way, the Television Academy still gives these internships today. They're very hard to get, but they're really, really good. They're in lots and lots of fields of media. And I'm now a judge for the Television Academy internships, and I encourage my students to, to apply for them. So my internship was on a morning show at Channel 7 here in Los Angeles, uh, five mornings a week. I think it was 9 to 10 a.m. And my original job was to be a PA. And, you know, lots and lots of people get their first jobs as a PA, even unpaid, paid, unpaid. Right. Um, yeah. And, and the deal now is, according to the law, at least in California, if you get a, an internship, it either has to be paid or you have to get college credit. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Sometimes people go under under the screen, you know, on that stuff. But that's that's the law. Um, but my internship was unpaid and I didn't get college credit. It was six weeks as a PA and people sort of think they might know what a PA is. It's production assistant. And um, but it can mean a lot, a lot of different things. And I tell my students, look, if you ever get the opportunity to be a production assistant, be sure you know what that means. Be sure they know what what you know, what they expect, because it means different things at different places. And in my case, it meant, you know, hanging out and being in the studio every day, being in the office every day for the production meetings, mostly listening, mostly watching. But they started to give me uh, the opportunity to write scripts for the show. And um, what is a script on an interview show? I mean, it's just a celebrity talk show. Well, a script on that kind of a show is an introduction to the guest and a, and a list of questions that you think would be interesting. And so I started writing those. And at the end of my six week internship, I was writing half of the scripts for the show every day. So they hired me. And uh, after I went back to college, they hired me back again. That was a really good experience. The other thing that I did while I was there is I would get there an hour and a half early to Channel 7 in Hollywood and sit in the control room and watch them do the morning news. Oh my gosh, that was so valuable just to watch the producer and the director and see how the whole team worked together. I mean, that's what I ended up doing for my whole career. So it was a wonderful experience at Channel 7 and having that internship. And that's those two things, the radio station and the, the morning show internship. That's really how I got started. Mm. I love all that, Steve, because to me, what that shows me is you just had that innate sense of curiosity when it came to your creativity. I love your path because it was predicated on you taking the initiative to go ahead and start to, to set the ball in motion, so to speak. I, I love that story that you told about being a DJ and, and being younger and like putting together your own shows. To me, that shows initiative that if somebody truly wants to get into whatever industry it may be, they need to take those first couple steps, which may seem to be the most frightening, but in the long term, that'll give you the, the basic steps that you need in the beginning to further down the line, continue to do so at a much higher scale. Like you said, when you kind of w worked your way into, the, into USC to work in the sports department. I, I love that story. So the other thing is, once you get your foot in the door, you've got to take advantage of that. And, that. and when I went into that press box, I literally had put my foot in the door. And you make yourself available and you let everybody know that you are willing to be helpful, but you learn while you're there. You keep your eyes open and your ears open to watch how things are done and watch for opportunities to move up and be helpful and watch for openings. I think sometimes too, Steve, what the 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 issue that some people may have because we get a lot of questions on our show with people asking well maybe i don't want to make myself seem a little bit too obtrusive i don't want to seem too pressing is there any bit of advice that you'd give to let's say a student listening or let's say somebody starting off in a pa position what what, what nuggets of advice would you give for a person to kind of let themselves be known but not necessarily get in the way of anybody that is a terrific question. And I think the best answer to that is to look for opportunities to when someone is not busy, is not under the gun, is not stressed and go up to them and say, hi, would you mind if I ask you a few questions? And that's how you make an acquaintance. And that's how you network. And that's how they know that you're interested and you're there. I think that's great. Because especially now with the world that we live in, Steve, with social media, with LinkedIn, there's so many opportunities for people to make themselves known and 
like some of the some of the things that I like to do for my own my own sake is I just like to check in with people, let them know I'm there. M- maybe not even so much in a work perspective, but more just as a friendly, hey, how's it going? Hope you had a great week. Or hey, if it's a holiday, hope you had a great holiday. Just letting yourself be known, I think, and keeping yourself on somebody's radar is important. And and also doing so networking in a way that isn't just in, in, trying to get yourself a job. Because I think oftentimes too, Steve, people can kind of tell when somebody just wants to get in and get out as soon as possible, right? Absolutely. And you might get the opportunity to be a PA or have some other job like an AD or something. And it's not exactly what you want to do. But if you don't have exactly what you want to do, take that opportunity. Use it as a learning experience. Uh, Watch the rest of the crew. See what everybody does. See how programs and projects are put together. And it will be very, very valuable. Uh, Even if it's not exactly the thing that you think you want to do, uh, you never know. And I love that you like you said, you would show up early, you'd get to see a little bit more than what you had originally signed up to do. Because I think that that as well, taking that, those steps to to learn a little bit more about everything. Don't, don't, don't just be so specific in your one pathway that you're going for. And so this is going out to anybody listening right now that, that when they ask, well, how do I learn more? Well, that's simply the key there. It's just be willing to show up early, be willing to be somebody that listens more than they speak, at least in the beginning. And I think right there is where you'll slowly start to gain the knowledge that you need to go on for a successful career. Let's go back for a second to the question that you asked about uh, how do you not overstep your bounds? That's um, a tough one. Um, I mean, not only should you take advantage of maybe going up to somebody and saying, do you mind if I ask you a few questions, but especially on a larger set, don't touch stuff that's not in your department. Be gentle about being uh, offering to help. Uh, don't get in the way. Stand back unless you're supposed to be uh, up front. Just watch a lot and, you know, say hi to people. Always greet people. Uh, let them know your name if you can. Say hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm here as a PA. I'm here as an AT, uh, AD, uh, whatever it might be. Make sure they know you. And, and when, it's, when the opportunity arises, say, if you need any help anyway, just let me know. Exactly, yeah, because I think, too, speaking on working on bigger sets, it can sometimes be very intimidating, especially for somebody just starting out or somebody that wants to get more of their foot in the door that you don't want to overstep your bounds. And especially with unions, you know, you literally cannot mess with somebody's equipment if you're not working in that. So I think that's all great. And Steve, pivoting a little bit away from that, I know from your experience after setting up yourself in the industry, you've gotten to work with some incredible people. One of my absolute heroes being Arnold Schwarzenegger, who I know you've had the pleasure of working with not once, but twice. Speak to us a little bit about how those experiences were working with Arnold and what was that like? Arnold was an amazing guy. Uh, He's got an amazing personality. It is, you hear about people who have magnetic personalities. He has an amazing magnetic personality and people just He's, he's like, it's got like an inner light, uh, incredible personality when he's around people. Um, my first experience with him was, uh, I had only been a director a few years. I didn't have much experience. I was working on a show called Eye on LA at Channel 7, which was a wonderful show to work on. I was a freelancer. Uh, and another guy who was also a segment producer came to me and said, um, I have this project w- with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Would you like to direct it? I was very, very surprised that I actually got that offer, but I think, I don't know why he came to me. He must have thought that I had more experience than I had, really, to tell you the truth. This was one of about three experiences that I've had in my life as a director, working with a producer who did not have his act together. And uh, so the idea was we were going to do a home video with Arnold called Shape Up with Arnold about about weight training. And uh, it ended up being 90 minutes long. And home videos were very, very big at that time. Uh, Jane Fonda had done a series that was very, very successful. Arnold was already a a well-known young star, probably in his 30s, and he had been in that documentary called Pumping Iron, which um, brought him to the attention of lots of people, and he had already done the first Conan the Barbarian, so he was known. So somehow this young producer got him uh, involved in this uh, home video project, and it was going to be a four-day shoot in an extremely small studio in Hollywood. 
And um, I, I said to uh, the producer, um, you know, think about uh, signing a DGA contract because you'll get better people and we'll be able to get an, a good AD and, and a good stage manager. And he did. They signed a DGA contract, which was also very surprising to me, but they did. Well, we went into this shoot, this four day shoot, got there on day one and there was no plan. There was no plan of what we were going to do. Uh, so Arnold and I went into a corner with uh, a line pad of paper and we spent 45 minutes doing three outlines. One was um, beginning weight training for men. Then there was be beginning tra weight training for women. And there was advanced weight training with this whole outline. And the producer's whole plan was we were going to shoot this as if it were live. There were going to be no stops. Uh, that's called live to tape. And even though we don't use tape anymore, the expression live to tape is still used all the time. This means uh, you start shooting and you don't stop until you're all the way through. You try never to stop. So that was the idea. Well, we started shooting this with Arnold. And I got to tell you, this whole live to tape business never lasted more than about 45 seconds before he would stop and go, what should I do next? So uh, altogether, um, it was not a great experience. Uh, and it ended up we had to do two or three days of editing, which was not in the budget, was not planned. The producer was very unhappy. Whoever had funded this was very unhappy. And the other thing that I always thought was strange about this project was it was not marketed well. This was a time when health clubs were very, very big. Health magazines were very, very big. Bodybuilding magazines were very, very big. And this should have been easy to market. Perhaps somebody was taking this as a tax write-off. I don't know, but I never saw it in a magazine. I never saw it in a health club. It never gained any traction, which was, was very unfortunate. So that was my first experience with Arnold, and it was a good experience, except for the producer, which they had no plan. So now fast forward many years, and he became the governor of California, which was kind of surprising. I really think he was elected on his name value. And uh, I was producing a show called uh, LA Roundtable. It was a serious talk show that uh, won an Emmy as a best talk and interview show in Los Angeles. And uh, Arnold was the governor and I wanted him on the show. Even though the typical format of the show was uh, four people around a very large round table talking about serious things, I wanted him on the show. And I started hounding his office, uh, which, is, which is what you have to do when you want a really important guest. And when you, when you get a big guest for a show, it's called a get. It's literally called a get. And this was a good, you know, they finally agreed that he would come and be on the show at a certain date and time. And it was a great get. And um, we would do three shows in a day and finish at one o'clock typically. So we would do like a nine o'clock show and then a 1030 show and then uh, maybe a 12 o'clock show. And Arnold was scheduled for the, the later show. I think he was scheduled to come in at one o'clock. And uh, we were going to take a lunch break before that. We we're going to have to reset the whole set because it wasn't going to be this big round table. It was going to be two really nice chairs. It was going to be a one-on-one -on -one interview. And around 1130-ish, we were shooting the second show. Right in the middle of it, my cell phone rang, and I answered it. And, he and this lady said, hi, this is the governor's secretary. Uh, do you still want him to come today? I said, yes. She said, okay, he'll be there in an hour. I said, what? He's not due for like two and a half hours. And here's what she said to me. Do you want him or don't you? Wow. Yeah. So I said, okay. And we finished shooting the show we were shooting, which is another 15 or 20 minutes. And I said to the crew, you know, here's what's happening. We're not going to have a lunch break. I need you guys to reset this the stage. I need it ready in an hour. And I went out to Subway and bought 19 sandwiches, brought them back for the crew. And um, his security people showed up and they were all the kind of guys, you know, that talk into their sleeves, you know, with the little microphones yeah. on their sleeves. And it was the strangest thing. They did a countdown. They said, the governor will be coming in in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the door opened and he walked in. Wow. <laughs> countdown. <laughs> so we did the interview and, you know, it went well. He was, as I said, very, very magnetic. Everybody was just drawn to him. And afterwards, the crew and I and, the, and, and Schwarzenegger stood on the set to take some, some souvenir photos. And while we were doing that, I said to him, hey, remember that home video we did, Sh Shape Up with Arnold? Do you ever watch it anymore? And he said, I'm going to try to do his accent. He said, oh, yes, we watch it every night. <laughs> I love that. Because that just shows his sense of humor, you know? And oh, that, yeah. And I'm sure he did remember working with you. And I love that you were able to keep that connection after all that time, you know? He probably tried to forget it. <laughs> But yeah, I, I love that story, Steve, because that's just another instance right there of you putting in the extra bit of work that 
wasn't shown to you ahead of time and you figured out a way <laughs> to get through all the muck and mire there. Cause, right? Because I think that that's a key thing that people should be aware of if they want to pursue a career in the industry is be willing to to be flexible, be willing to to know when you're working, especially with such high high caliber talent like an Arnold, is that there is going to be instances where it's like, okay, it's now or never. We've got to yeah. figure this out. Number one is a always have a plan as a producer and then as a director have a plan. And, and you know when we shot that home video, the first one, there was no plan. And then secondly, when you're shooting a project, have a backup plan. Uh, both in advance and while it's happening, uh, things will not, things will rarely go exactly as you planned. So be ready to pivot and be ready to save it. Yeah. Exactly. I think those are such great nuggets of advice right there. And I know you've got some other incredible stories, Steve. One of the ones that really piqued my interest was you with Hugh Hefner at the Playboy Mansion. We, we, we hear so many stories come out of the Playboy Mansion. We've got to hear Steve Miller's. What happened there? I was working on this show called I in LA at Channel 7, which I loved. It was one of the most fun things I, I've ever done. It was a magazine show. A magazine show is a show that usually is a half hour, and you have about four different stories in it, and they're not necessarily related to each other. Sometimes they are. But I in LA was a very sexy, very high-energy show, very much uh, in the MTV mold which was very colorful, very fast paced with lots of music. And the great thing about working on it as, as a segment producer was the crew, uh, both the, um, the camera crew, uh, who I went out with and shot with, and the editors, both fantastic, very creative, added, added a lot to uh, the stories and made them look great and fast paced. And so um, because the show was very sexy and sort of provocative really, um, I got to go to the Playboy Mansion a lot, and I did uh, stories on the Playmate of the Year and the parties and all this stuff, and I interviewed uh, Hugh Hefner, I think, three times. He was a very, very nice guy. He always had his uh, bathrobe and his pajamas on every single time. I think mostly I interviewed him in his library, and I was told, I actually didn't see this myself, I was told that he would drink six Diet Pepsis every day. I don't know. But um, I gave him his uh, kick in his step every day. It, it, was, it was a fun show, show to do, and I did lots of great segments. My very first segment that I was ever hired to do on that show was by, I got about, I'm sorry, my very first segment that I was ever hired to do on that show was about a guy named Cal Worthington, who was a used car salesman, very well known in Los Angeles back then, and he would run these commercials all the time on television with what he called his dog spot. But his dog spot was a monkey. And uh, I went out and, and did this story about him. And uh, then they hired me to do lots and lots of stories after that. I love that. I, I love that in your position, Steve, you've encountered so many great people and you've got so many great stories because I think that's another aspect of the industry that people should hold on to is these great memories that you make along the way. Like the fact that you've gotten to meet these iconic people, but also you get to, to, to say now, You've lived a great life there. You've met these people. You've experienced these great experiences. And at the end of the day, that's that's another key thing that people should keep in their hearts is, yes, it is about making money. It is about gaining success, whatever you may think that may be. But it's also about making these memories and having fun along the way, is it not? It is, and most of my experiences were with celebrities uh, were good experiences. Most of them are very, very nice people for the most part. You have to, as soon as you meet them, kind of scope out their personality. How much direction are they willing to take? Are they friendly? Are they? Uh, do they have anxiety? Um, and, and some are much, much uh, easier to work with than others. I want to tell you about one experience that I had with a very famous actor named Burgess Meredith that was one of two times where I really thought I was going to have a heart attack. Um, Burgess Meredith was um, the the manager of Rocky in the Rocky movies, Mickey. especially yep. the first two. He was the older guy with the knit yep. cap. Mickey. And, uh, yeah. And also he was known as a narrator, as a voiceover guy, uh, especially on a PBS public broadcasting series called Nova, a science series that was on nearly every every week. And um, one of the things I used to do at KCET, the public television station in Los Angeles, was do some fundraising drives, some membership drives 
we would come on in between the biggest shows like three times a year and we would say to people please call in and join for 35 bucks or whatever we'd have big phone banks full of volunteers and the phones would ring and there was a lot of excitement so he had narrated a, a Nova show that had uh, was going to uh, air and had had a lot of publicity, and we wanted him to come in right after that Nova show, which was going to be 9 p.m. break, and ask people to call in. And we called him somehow, and we got him. Had to send somebody out to Malibu to pick him up at his home and drive him to the studio. And he came into the studio about 15 or 20 minutes before the break, and I thought he had had a stroke right off the bat. Couldn't communicate, couldn't answer my questions, I wanted him to rehearse his little script off the teleprompter and we tried and it was not successful. We were about to go on the air live. And I thought, well, either Burgess Meredith or I are gonna die right now because this is just gonna be horrible. And we came on and the stage manager cued him and it was like an alien transformation. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it again. He stood up straight, he smiled, he looked into the camera and he read that script. The telephones went crazy, people called in it lasted 10 or 15 minutes it ended we went to the next show and he curled up again and he said please take me home wow <laughs> it, uh, I, it almost reminds me of stories that i hear from uh, older rock stars guys like ozzy osbourne like you you hear these stories of these guys that when they show up they almost seem so aloof you don't even think they're going to be able to perform and then once the light goes on something inside of them there's still that spark especially with somebody like Burgess, who was a, a legend that he, he did such great work on shows like Twilight Zone even. And he, he even knew that no matter what, he may be crunched over, he may be out of it, but when those lights go on, you know, he knew he had to perform. And what, what was your perspective seeing that firsthand? Like afterwards, what did you think of the whole situation after? Well, first of all, I was very scared. I was shaking. <laughs> I'm glad that I don't think anything like that ever happened again yeah. after that. Um, I, I don't think there was any way to avoid it. There was no publicist involved. Sometimes a publicist can help you, especially if they're being truthful right. and letting you know what the situation is. Um, but in that case, there was no publicist involved. Um, by the way, uh, because of working at KCET and working on those fundraising things, I had an am amazing Rolodex of celebrity contacts, which I still have, uh, although most of these people are pretty much aging by now. But I had home phone numbers and home addresses and contacts. And um, that's something that I recommend to, to, to everybody in production, um, not just celebrities, but everybody you work with on a set, everybody who hires you keep their number put it in your your cell phone or wherever you keep contacts keep everything about them keep their cell phone number keep who they are as part of your contact uh and and keep their email address and when i say keep who they are as part of your contact if somebody is a cin cinematographer or a director or a producer or an ad write that down as part of your contact so that if you can't remember their name but you remember there was an associate producer you can search for that and find it I love that. And that's something I absolutely 100% back that always, always remember people because like you stated, even if you may not need them now, you may not need them in a year, but who knows five years down the line when you're looking for a cinematographer last minute, Hey, I've got this phone number of this person. And now all of a sudden you've got the person on the job. And then just as we wind down here, Steve, I, love to ask these types of questions because I we get so many different answers but if all the stars were aligned and if you could choose your dream project your dream talent to work with what would that look like I would love to direct and shoot more music and more concerts uh, I've done a few um, the biggest one was probably uh, Demi Lovato on in the middle of Hollywood Boulevard on a stage in the middle of Hollywood Boulevard it was fun to do no rehearsal uh, and, and I love music. Um, I love listening to music. I love singing along to music. I'm in a band. And uh, so, yeah, I'd love to shoot more music. Well, Steve, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you for these amazing stories. I know we could keep on going and having much, much more awesome tales to tell. But I'll, that'll be for other times. But, Steve, just thank you so much once again. It was a pleasure learning from you in class. It was a pleasure learning from you right here. And hopefully down the line, we'll be able to collab on something as well. You're always welcome on the show anytime, Steve. Thanks a million, Danny.